Welcome to Bible class at the Greenbury Church of Christ. We really do appreciate your presence as we continue our study of Old Testament Scripture under the title of The Emerging Nation. It is the history of Israel from Judges to the death of Solomon. And today our focus is going to return to Samuel, but especially to Samuel's role in anointing the first king of Israel, King Saul. Let's pray before we continue, and then we'll soon get into the text. Our Holy Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for your gift of another day, this Lord's Day. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to be together in praise and worship and in remembrance. And I pray, Father, that we'll never forget the story, the, the truth that shapes who we are. That is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. Thank you, God, for loving us that much. To remember you so loved the world that you gave your only Son. And we are thankful. For we know, Father, that, that affects us all and that affects us individually. Father, I pray that you'll forgive us when we forget that, when we go our own way, when we do things that are a great offense to you. Please, Father, forgive us. And now, Father, help us as we read of these things of old, yet things that, that really uh, speak of, of the very ki same kinds of challenges and same kinds of needs that we have today. Oh, Lord, be with us as we read your, your Scripture. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Read with me. I've chosen this as the reading for our time in Samuel. And it comes from chapter 12, some words of Sam, a longer speech of Samuel. But it seems to me to well summarize what he was doing and his role in Israel. So please read with me. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things He has done for you. And those very words, <clears throat> we're going to kind of hear, we can hear those words and that concern of, uh, of Samuel echoing in what happens in chapter 9 and chapter 10. And you know, as I, I've read that, of course, several times, now reading it with you, it, it really struck me that I would sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. That's probably a, a lesson that needs to be pursued somewhere along the way. Well, 1 Samuel should always be read with judges in the background because it is a huge contrast in terms of what you see. Excuse me, what you see in judges and then what the kind of leader that you find in Samuel is compared to all of the judges. So you need to always keep judges in mind. It is a response to the need for wise and faithful leaders. And that's what's going on in First and Second Samuel. As, as Samuel is instrumental and key to um, um, helping Israel... Uh, developed from competing tribes to a unified kingdom. And we'll see the, a big step in those, in those terms here in, in 1 Samuel 9 and 10. The account of Samuel began before his conception. His father was Elkanah, his mother was Hannah. And you know the story, Hannah was barren, had no children. Her name means grace. And truly the grace of God visited her when she conceived and bore Samuel. Elkanah is a, a, a godly man. His name means God has possessed or God has created. He was a Levite, which really a, a fits his apparent godliness. For they were faithful in going to Shiloh to worship God. And of course, it was there that Hannah prayed. And hey, sure, her prayer was for a child. And then her commitment was that she would give that child to God to be a servant of God all his life. And truly, her prayers were completely answered. In the previous lesson, 
<clears throat> we read the, the part of Samuel, 1 Samuel 3, when the Lord came and stood calling, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and, and Samuel gave that this very memorable sort of reply, speak, or as Eli had told him to say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And then his first action was an action that called for the repentance of Israel. He gathered Israel at the place called Mizpah, which, as we will see in the lesson today, continued to be a, an important location for the assembling of all the tribes of Israel, or at least representatives of those tribes. And when he gathered Israel together in that place, he led them in worship, and he prayed for Israel. And uh, then we're going to fast forward now to 1 Samuel 9 and 10. And in 1 Samuel 9 and 10, because this, this will be, uh, let's say, after a brief look at chapter 8, uh, some words out of chapter 8, we'll see that, that this is what uh, God was calling Samuel to do. That is, to anoint the, uh, the king, Saul. Uh, Saul is going to be confirmed, in, is not only called and anointed and confirmed as king in 1 Samuel 9 and 10, but we also need to ask the question, what led to this? What led to Saul's calling and confirmation? And here's the background of that part of the story. 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 2. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, there ought to be a bit of a, a remembrance of when that happened once before. That is, Eli and his sons. Well, the name of Samuel's firstborn son was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not war again. Here's the same story we hear. And it's really, it, it's sort of striking because Samuel would have known about that uh, and all that happened in, in Eli's life. In fact, God told him to deliver the message to, to Eli. And, and yet, the very same thing happens in his own life. His sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king. Here is the background. But that's not, it's the background of the people's request. But there's also more at work here as well, which we will see. But I underline this. This is an important sentence to remember. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But this displeased Samuel. Although it would have seemed to me in his heart he would have known that uh, his uh, family certainly could not continue as leaders of Israel. But he kind of takes it personally. He, it displeased him when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel did the right thing, though. In his displeasure, he chose to approach God and pray to God. And he did. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being a king over them. I should have underlined that. That is also a very significant, those very significant words in understanding the flow of, of events here. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they also are doing to you. In other words, they're no longer listening to your preaching and, and really truly devoting themselves to the kind of leadership you have given them. They have forsaken you just like they've forsaken me. What, one, one of the themes that is it, it runs throughout uh, much of Old Testament history is these are a people who continue to forget their story. And forgetting their story means that they have forgotten God. And so God says, Obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the King who shall reign over them. And so essentially the instruction is, do 
what they are asking and tell them the truth. And so we come to the record of finding, anointing, and ordaining Saul in 1 Samuel 9 and 10. And I'm going to do something now that I would really rather not do, but we don't have the time. I would like to read that in those entire two chapters, but that would take a bit too long. We don't have the time for that. So what I ask you to do is just open up the page, open up to 1 Samuel 9 and 10, and follow along as I go through the text and make comments on each part of it. So here's how the story of the calling of Saul begins. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becheroth, son of Aphiah, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. Saul's story begins like Samuel's story began. It begins with his father, the father of a son. Uh, it begins with the father of the son along with a four-generation genealogy. We also should note that Kish is identified as a man of wealth. And this word could be translated several ways. A man of standing, a man of importance, a man of influence. And so together he is a person of influence, power, and wealth. Which suggests that Saul comes out of one of the most influential families in the tribe of Benjamin, which was the smallest of all the tribes. And in a way that's going to come up a little bit later in the text. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. In other words, Kish had a son who looked like a king. Or so, thinking in terms of the world, that's what we would think. He was obviously impressive, tall, handsome, without equal, it says. And that's going to be noted twice. But we also should read this very carefully. And I'm thankful to a commentator whose last name is Bergen, who, who suggests that this is, a, is the first hint to the fact that things are not going to go well with Saul. Saul is the only Israelite specifically noted in the Bible as being tall. Elsewhere, being tall was attributed to Israel's enemies. And so, what is happening here is that Israel is asking a, for a king like all the other nations. And basically, I think what we see develop is that the Lord gives them the desires of their heart even down to the physical details. And I'm not going to do this, but what we need to do, and it, actually in the lesson to follow, it will come up, but what you need to do is sort of uh, compare this description of Saul, the first king of Israel, with the kind of description we'll get of David, the second king of Israel. Now, here's an odd little story. It's an odd story that follows that will continue to confirm the fact that Saul will be a king like other nations. Here he is a shepherd, not of sheep, but he is a shepherd, so to speak, a herder of donkeys. Animals a bit larger than sheep. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, take one of the young men with you and arise and go look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim. I don't have a map. I wish I did. But basically, he went all over creation so to speak that's how we would say it he went all over creation looking for these donkeys up to the hill country of Ephraim passed through the land of Shalisha they didn't find them they passed through the land of Shalim but they were not there then they passed through the land of Benjamin but did not find them and when they came to the land of Zuf Saul said to his servant who was with him come let us go back lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. So Saul's uh, attention span in this, uh, in this search, this responsibility is beginning to wane. He's worried about his dad now instead of the donkeys. But the servant, but the he actually refers to the servant. The, he, the servant said, Behold, 
There is a man of God in this city. And he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now, let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way that we should go. So it's from his servant or slave that Saul gets the next step into what, uh, what needs to be done. No, no, let's not go. Let's go seek some help. Let's look for some good advice. Maybe the man of God can tell us where to go. And of course, the man of God was Samuel. Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there's no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? Uh, he's, you know, they're run out of food. And uh, he doesn't have anything to uh, reward the man of God for, or give the man of God for the instru- uh, whatever uh, advice that he gives them. And again, the servant steps up and, and in a sense is leading Saul. You would think Saul is in leadership, but the servant is actually leading Saul. The servant answered, said, Here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God uh, to tell us our way, which way should go. And then the author of 1 Samuel 9 uh, kind of interrupts here, and translators put this in parentheses because they have to explain a word. It's kind of interesting. This means this history was written long enough after what happened here uh, so that uh, a word had changed a bit. Seer is a word that means, uh, suggests a, a person who has visions. A prophet is a word that means one who is a spokesman. And truly, that, that's a significant distinction, I think, because later on, all the prophets were basically not people who had visions of the future, although a little bit of that's going to happen. But they also are, are people who are speaking for God. They were spokesmen for God. So formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Now the day before Saul came, here's a little bit of background before they meet. The day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. Prince in the ESV is translated ruler in the NIV. So again, a Hebrew word that has multiple English meanings. It means prince or or you would understand him to be the ruler or the leader as it is translated in the New Living Translation. So one of the things we see here is deeper than any motives kind of driving this encounter, kind of on the surface level, Here's Saul and his servant looking for donkeys that they can't find, and they're going to go try to get some help from someone who can uh, uh, give them some direction. And and yet we also know that in uh, in all of this, this is basically the Lord fulfilling His promise to give Israel the new leader that they desire. One who would deliver Israel from the land of the Philistines. So when Samuel saw Saul, uh, let me move on. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, "Here is the man of the man of whom I spoke to you. It is he who, who shall restrain my people." Now that's an interesting word translated in the ESV uh, as "restrain." In the New King James Version, it here's the one who will reign over or govern. It's a Hebrew word that, that really has, uh, m- instead of govern, it does have the meaning of restrain. To restrain or hold back or hinder. It could even be, although contextually this is not the case here, contextually it could mean, imp- um, I mean, in other contexts it could mean imprisoned. That's not what it means here. But the core meaning is, here is a person who is going to restrain my people from doing the kinds of things that they do that uh, are 
basically so offensive to the ways of God. For the most part, this word in, throughout the Old Testament is used in a negative sort of way. This is the only place that it could be taken in a positive way, like rule or govern. But in a sense, uh, the, the, the king's restraint for the people can be very positive. That is, he is restraining them, uh, leading them in the way that they should go. Or the, the word, or uh, the action of a king in restraining his people could also be very negative in that he becomes one who becomes so oppressive to them, which is actually what is going to happen later on, in a sense with Saul, but more particularly with Solomon later on. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, uh, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? And Samuel answered Saul, I'm the seer. I'm the one you're looking for. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. Now, a part of this, I actually skipped over a piece of the text, and if you're following along, you've noticed that. But uh, actually, Saul came to this city on a day that, uh, that Samuel was going up to a time of worship and sacrifice, and he was going to bless the sacrifices. But involved in those sacrifices offered to God was also a time when they would actually eat the sacrifice. It became a, a fellowship meal, so to speak, for the people. And Saul, Samuel was going to be a part of all that. So he just invites Saul to go up with him to be a part of that. I will, uh, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. And then in nine, chapter 9, verse 20, uh, As for you and your donkeys. Now, here he gets Saul's attention. Because how would Samuel know what Saul is up to if Saul nor his servant had really said anything about it? As for you donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Again, he must have wondered, how did he know about all of that? And that sort of frames this reaction. I, it seems to me the, the flow of uh, conversation here is a bit... Uh, 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 it, it, do, it doesn't quite communicate the meaning of what is going on. Saul answered, well, uh, help, help, us, help us here. Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of all the tribes of Israel? In other words, Saul interpreted what Samuel said, and it would seem to me that Saul also realized that, uh-oh, there's a lot more at going on here than I realized. And he's talking about me in relation to all of Israel in the previous verse. And, and so he, he begins to kind of, let's say, pull away, back up a little bit from from what Samuel is saying. No, 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 no. You, you're, I, I'm not the one. Uh, why would anyone want me for anything? I'm of the least of the tribe. Uh, I'm a member of the least tribe in Israel. And my clan is the humblest of all the clans, which really contrasts with how this chapter began with the, uh, 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 just the little word about Saul's father being a man of standing. But, what we can infer in this is Saul realizes that um, Samuel is talking about some things that are suggesting some things that he's not sure he's up to. And uh, in a way, I think you can just summarize all of what he says here is, well, maybe it'd be better for you to look elsewhere. So let's skip on to verse 26. At the break of dawn, so the meal has been shared. Uh, at that night, Saul was given a place to sleep up on top of Samuel's house. 
that would be the guest bedroom. And in a sense, in that country, depending on the, the I would assume this was uh, not wintertime. Uh, that's, a, that's a fair assumption. And uh, he, he was kind of given the most comfortable place during the spring, summer, and fall to sleep. So Samuel called to Saul. He was sleeping up on the roof. Up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. And then Samuel does the very hospitable thing of walking with Saul to the gates of the city. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, so here is Samuel walking along with Saul. And, he, and then he does something that's really unusual. Tell the servant to pass on before us. And when he's passed on, stop here yourself. In other words, I want a little bit of private time with you that I may make known to you the Word of God. This request for some private time is, is, is based on a rather provocative sort of a, oh, what, what is the Word of God? What is, is there a Word of God for me? And then he, he enacts the Word of God. First of all, it just, he takes a flask of oil, he pours it on Saul's head, kisses him and says, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over His people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you shall save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over His heritage. Let me pause here for just a couple of things. So, Samuel both acts out and speaks the Word of God. The Word of God is to anoint Saul to be king. And then, uh, this explanation that we're going to get, which is going to fo continue to follow in this chapter, is really the longest recorded speech to an individual that Saul Samuel will make in First and Second Samuel. And then, uh, the thing that I noticed is the description of Israel. In fact, I think I highlight that right here. The description of Israel is the Lord's heritage. It's an interesting way of describing what is happening. When we think of Saul as king, we probably think of Israel as his and his kingdom. But, uh, but that's not the case. Israel belonged to God. And it suggests to me that Saul would have done well to have understood his responsibility as king in terms of stewardship. He was taking care of that which was not his own, but that which belonged to God. But it would seem to me that over time, Saul forgot that. Uh, he 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 really began to have a a very possessive uh, feeling about Israel as his kingdom, not that which belonged to God. And now, in order to confirm what Samuel has not only done but said regarding uh, Saul being the prince or the re leader or ruler over the people of Israel. Then he begins to speak of, here's what's going to happen in the next few days. Or beginning today. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza. And they will say to you, the donkeys that you went to seek are found. And now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you, saying, what shall I do? about my son. That's the first sign. You're going to meet uh, two men. And then, the next sign. Then you shall go from there farther and come to the oak of Tabor. And notice how there's a bit of intensity in these signs that will confirm what Samuel has said and done to Saul. First it's two men. Now it's three men. And the, the, the group that uh, the, the number that follows is simply described as a group. So, you're going to meet th uh, three men. 
at the Oak of Tabor. And they're going to be going up to God at Bethel. Bethel was a, a, a well-known and long-established place of worship for the people of Israel. It was at Bethel, the house of God. Uh, the meaning of Bethel is house of God. That's where Jacob had his dream of angels ascending and descending on a ladder into heaven. So they're on the way to Bethel and for what's described here to worship God. They're carrying three young goats, another's carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a skin of wine, and they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread. Uh, in a sense, you could understand this as, uh, as holy bread. It was bread being taken for the sacrifice. And Saul, as we know, who doesn't have any bread, uh, although he did get to eat at Samuel's place, um, he needs some bread. So he gets to eat that kind of bread, that bread of sacrifice. And uh, something similar will actually happen in David's life in 1 Samuel 21. This will happen at Gibeath Elohim, which was another high place or a high place of worship, which uh, means hill of God. And this could be Saul's own city, the city of Gibeah. And so, uh, I'm sorry, the, he, he took the two loaves of bread from the three men and then he will meet a group of people uh, at Gibeah, Gibeah Elohim, where there's also a garrison of Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group uh, of pros prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them prophesying. We want to notice something of the <coughs> emphasis of the text in, in things that are, are doubled. That is, Saul is informed that the donkey's returned twice. <coughs> Excuse me. He receives the food of sacrifices twice. And Saul receives the holy anointing in the presence of a prophet. Uh, in 10.1 and then later in 10, he receives the Spirit of God. So uh, we see kind of the circular... A way of, of uh, uh, giving account for what happens here in the confirmation of, of to, to Saul uh, to Saul about what Samuel had said. Here's an interesting thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now, when these signs meet you, do not do what your hand finds to do. Here, here will be the completion of the signs. And here it is that the Spirit of God rushes upon him so that he, and the evidence of the Spirit of God in his life here is that he will prophesy along with these other prophets. And so Saul, a man who is not recognized as a prophet, will begin to prophesy. We're not told what they were doing or exactly other than prophesying we're not told what they were saying but we do know that Saul um, joins them in what they were doing because the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him which is very uh, typical language for how the spirit of God enters into the life of someone in the book of Judges and now in the book of 1 Samuel then go down before me to Gilgal. So after all of these things happen, go to Gilgal, and I'm going to meet you there. And we will offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings, but you're going to have to wait seven days. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. And so, um, so he's going to have these signs of confirmation. Go to Gilgal, wait for... Uh, Samuel to come again and then the next steps will be taken in terms of revealing Saul to all of Israel. Because so far, the only people who really know what's going on here until uh, Saul actually begins to prophesy 
But all of most of uh, everything from nine one up to ten one in the first few verses of ten, it's all pr- it's all been private. It's just between Samuel and Saul, and of course his servant would have known something about what's going on. But he's not yet been revealed to Israel, and so when he turned to his back to leave God, uh, I leave Samuel. God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. Here, here, this is remarkable and rather puzzling or tantalizing, I guess, in terms of seeking the meaning of this. So when he, Saul, turned his shoulder to go from Samuel, God turned him into another man, so to speak. God gave him a changed heart so that internally he could grow up to the level of his changed circumstances. For he was already anointed as king of Israel. So he's going to have to live up to that. And that will the, God gave him a lot of help to do that. That is a changed heart and the Spirit of God rushing upon him. We can conclude, I think, at this point. He's no longer worried about lost donkeys. Now his responsibilities as one who was a herder dramatically increases. And for that, he needs another heart. And he needs the Spirit of God. It would seem to me also that the, those phrases, another heart and the Spirit of God rushing upon them, that's kind of uh, two, two sides of the same coin. That's a way of saying how God entered into his life and changed Saul. And Saul was changed because God was at work within him. And the evidence of the Spirit presence in his life is that uh, he prophesied with uh, those prophets. And that caught everyone else who knew Saul by surprise. When all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, what's come over the son of Kish? I think uh, kind of a a good paraphrase of meaning for our context was, who does he think he is? A prophet? He's not a prophet. We know that. Is Saul among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, and who is their father. Who does he think he is? He's, he, he's behaving in an illegitimate way. And again, the, the, the writer of 1 Samuel, little parenthetical sort of statement, therefore it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. So that first half of of, uh, of uh, it's actually the last half of verse 12. Therefore, it became a prophet proverb, is Saul also among the prophets. In other words, when you see something that doesn't quite fit together, it doesn't fit that Saul is a prophet. So when things don't quite ha- fit together or add up, when there's any kind of incongruous alliance, uh, then that proverb begins to fit because that's what they thought about Saul. <clears throat> Well, his kinfolks come to him, his uncle comes to him, and he said to him and to his servants, where did you go? I want to know more. Where have you been? (coughs) And (coughs) Excuse me. Saul said to seek the donkeys. And when we saw that they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Oh. It's kind of interesting as you read the text, uh, it, it looks like Saul didn't even know who Samuel was, <coughs> which is very interesting given the fact that Samuel was such a leader over all of Israel. But everything, the, the hints of the text is that Saul didn't know who Samuel was, but obviously his uncle knows Samuel, and he wants to know. Tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found, but he didn't tell the whole truth here, did he? 
He didn't tell the whole story about the matter of the kingdom. And it's interesting here because it's the first time the word kingdom is used in relation to what's going on. <coughs> Saul becoming king of a kingdom. About that matter of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. Now, Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. So here we're moving into the next thing that needs to happen. And the next thing that needs to happen is uh, all of the people need to know that Sa Saul has been anointed king of Israel. Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and they said to the people, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt. Again, notice how uh, time and again the story is told. The story is told uh, such that they would be prompted to remember who they were and from whence they had come. I brought up Egypt, Israel out of Egypt. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God. Again, and this is, this is what's going, in a sense, uh, what is going on here is God's will. This is entirely where God intends to take these folk. It is in answer to their request or to their prayer. Uh, but, but it also at the heart of they have rejected God who was their king, who saved them from all calamities and all distresses. And you have said to him, set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your th thousands. And so, again, Samuel obeys God. He's going to proceed with the revelation in, of Saul as, as king over Israel. <laughs> he, he, he's going to tell them the truth. This is what is really going on. And it's interesting to me here that the people, uh, it, it's almost as if they did not hear that. They did not repent in any way and turn to God. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near the tribe of Benjamin. So there's a process of choosing a straw or casting a lot. <coughs> and yeah, the lot falls to Benjamin. And then Benjamin is brought before Samuel in terms of its clans. <clears throat> and the clan of the Matrites was taken by Lot. And then finally, uh, the process works it down to the one that they're looking for, and that is Saul. But again, another odd little story, like the, the pursuit of the donkeys, an odd story. Here, they sought him, but he could not be found. And so they turned to the Lord. Is, is there someone still to come? It looks like we're looking, but Saul's nowhere to be found. And the Lord says, behold, he has hidden himself among the, ba the baggage. Then they ran <coughs> and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, again, this notation about or uh, recognition of his height. He was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Which is kind of interesting. How do you hide a fellow like that? <laughs> but Saul himself was hiding. Why did he hide? He had really had time to prepare himself for this moment. The signs that followed the anointing and what Samuel said about that. The signs that followed. And uh, seven days waiting at Gilgal for Samuel to come. And uh, he really had time to prepare himself, but it seems that he had not been able to see himself in the role of the king, though he had now had the assurance of the prophetic anointing confirmed. Reluctantly, he re revealed himself, and uh, here's how the people respond. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And the people shouted, Long live the king. And Samuel stays focused. He stays focused on what the king now and his people need to hear. He told the people the rights and duties of the kingship. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. 
Then Samuel sent the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home at Gil, Gil, Gibeah. And with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. And so, again, God is helping him all along the way with a new heart. The Spirit of God rushing upon him. Now men gathered around him. But there's one little hint at the end of this chapter uh, that there's still going to be some trouble. And some worthless fellows said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. Which uh, indicate he's not willing to engage that conflict. He should know that there is great conflict to come regarding the Philistines. Well, in summary... Uh, It's interesting, and I appreciate the commentator Bergen on this, that, that really this is a record that has hints that it will not go well. And, and in a sense, we know that because we've read the rest of the story. But as people are reading this for the first time, they would pick up on those hints. What's going to happen? Because, because you would think that, okay, Israel gets the king and everything is going to be great and they lived happily ever after. But there's hints that, that that's not the case. And we would naturally ask, why? Why would the Lord permit this sort of thing to develop and to happen? And I think the answer is here. <clears throat> God gave them what they asked for. God gave them a king to judge us like all the nations. That's what they were wanting. And that's what God gave them. And I think a take home from Israel experience here is be careful what you ask of God. Or we might get a king like all the nations. But later on, in the wisdom of, of, the, of, the, of the wise folk of Israel, they're going to say things in the Psalms like, put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. But isn't it true that we believe, and I know, I, I mean, you can take Saul and David and contrast the true, the two. Uh, Israel suffered under Saul. Israel is going to do better under David, although there will be times of suffering under David as well. But, I know it makes a difference. You do want a good king, and a good king can make a lot of difference. But the truth is, our salvation is in the Lord. And I think, I think that is something that, that believing people need to carry with them in, these day, in the political climate in which we live in these days. The Spirit of the Lord will rush upon him. That's unusual language for us. It means he's pushing forward, breaking out, coming mightily. And in the Old Testament, Judges in 1 Samuel, the uh, purpose of that is that, that the person involved would be equipped and empowered to serve God. And for the most part, it appears that it's only for a period of time, not a continuing or all, for the remainder of that person's life. Although it would seem to me for David, uh, for David, the Spirit of God was with him all, the li all, all, all his life. But I, the reason I look at this is because that's truly a contrast with how we experience the Holy Spirit. I, I recognize the Spirit can do what the Spirit chooses to do and would do many, can do mighty things among us. But for the most part, we receive the Spirit at our baptism, and He is going to remain with us through all our lives for the sake of our sanctification. Thank you very much for your presence today, for the time that we've been able to spend in this important part of Israel's history. For the lesson to follow, read everything between 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, but we're going to focus on 1 Samuel 16, and that is the the rejection of Saul 
and the anointment of David and probably gather some things around that. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.